Your kid is getting their license and it's terrifying. I am in this situation currently. Welcome to this episode of Awkward Conversations. I'm your host, Jody Sweeten. And joining me as always is... Amy McCarthy, and I'm the Director of Social Work at Boston Children's Hospital. Always wonderful to have you. And we have a very special guest today, Rick Burt, the former CEO of SAD and currently the Director of DC's Highway Safety Office. Uh, Rick, thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, And he is here to speak to the subject of teenagers driving, which is really, really, really terrifying. Uh, And also communicating the dangers of driving under the influence to teenagers. Yeah, thanks. Jody and Amy, always great to be with you. Really appreciate the opportunity to share with our listeners. Look, we understand the pressure that young people and parents are under. When you get those keys, it's a moment of excitement. It's an opportunity for uh, independence, but it's also a really scary moment. For many young people, they take for granted the risks and the pressures that they're about to face as a new driver. But let's actually back up for a moment, because I would argue that the moment of interaction should actually start well before those keys are handed. We forget the minute that car seat turns around, they're watching you as you're toggling on your phone. They're watching you as you're going those five or 10 miles over the speed limit. Um, They're understanding what's right and what's wrong behind the wheel. And so really, that work starts as soon as you've got a toddler in the back seat. Don't think that that work about being creating a safe driver starts when you've got a 15 or 16 year old. It starts much younger. And it has to be a conversation that's really ongoing. You know, when you are um, talking to a middle schooler, that's about talking about the importance of buckling up each and every time you get inside the wheel, being a smart and safe pedestrian if you're crossing crosswalks. And then as you hand those keys to that young person, that should really be a sign of transition now. Instead of you're being the, the project manager, you're now the consultant, making sure that young persons continue to refine their skills, develop their skills, and execute those skills each and every time they get behind the wheel. Uh, working with smaller kiddos or with smaller kiddos running around, don't think that that work about being creating a safe driver starts when you've got a 15 or 16-year-old. It starts much younger. And it has to be a conversation that's really on going. You know, when you are um, talking to a middle schooler, that's about talking about the importance of buckling up each and every time you get inside the wheel, being a smart and safe pedestrian if you're crossing crosswalks. And then as you hand those keys to that young person, that should really be a sign of transition now. Instead of you being the the project manager, you're now the consultant uh, and being an ongoing engagement force, making sure that young persons continue to refine their skills, develop their skills, and execute those skills each and every time they get behind the wheel. Um, Are there any things related to, uh, you know, drugs and alcohol and driving uh, and resisting that peer pressure that you can talk about or speak to? How do we keep them from doing that when they have, you know, quote unquote, the, the keys in their hand? Yeah, quite literally and figuratively, right? I mean, they're the ones who are dictating their behavior and they're dictating what behavior is going to be acceptable for them as a driver, but also what what passengers they put inside their vehicle. You know, like so many things that you all talk about, it starts with a conversation. It starts with a conversation to make sure that there are, are mutually understood expectations of what is acceptable and unacceptable. Again, that messaging starts young, but it only continues when you're when you've got an adolescent at home. We understand that they're facing those pressures to make risky choices. We forget that the adolescent brain isn't fully developed until the age of 25, and so we're literally talking to a hormonal beast that's trying to recognize the world around them and make sense of that while also trying to fit in. And so sometimes there is that additional pressure to try alcohol, to try substances. And so the first thing to do is I, I like to tell parents separate the behavior from driving. You know, have a conversation around substance use and around alcohol and have that conversation about why those behaviors are risky, particularly Gen Z. They don't want to just be given vain threats or, you know, uh, hollow it out uh, semantics of, you know, from 1980 films. Uh, they right. want to they want to understand why that's risky to them. And so you can get a little bit nerdy. Um, our partners at the DEA, at, at NIH, have really great resources on how to start that conversation and how to keep it going to talk about, hey, there, there actually is a risk. Each time you do consume alcohol, it literally does change the way your brain functions, and that can have long-term impacts. The same thing with things like cannabis, which are really a hotbed of conversations across this country. And, and, and to highlight the risks and the dangers of that pose, I think you have to first separate it from driving to understand why it can be a risky decision. And then when you multiply that or exponentially multiply that by putting it behind the wheel, now we have an even broader context to understand why this is risky. And then when you frame that in the context of you're not just putting yourself at risk, Uh, you're putting others at risk as well. Numerous research projects 
have shown that the, the greatest fear that young people have is the, the fear of hurting someone else because of their own wrongdoing or their own, uh, their own mistakes that they might make as, a, as an adolescent or as a young driver. So I'm, I'm not saying uh, ramp up the fear factor. We know that can be uh, only limitedly effective in, in some situations, but really talk about the visceral impact. There are great resources from SAD and MAD that have unfortunately can talk about and highlight how some folks have made those wrong choices and now have to live with right. those consequences in the short term and the long term. And then also make sure you, you manage those expectations in terms of consequences, that if you were to make wrong choices behind the wheel, if you were to exceed the number of passengers stay out beyond curfew, um, heaven forbid, be impaired behind the, drive, behind the wheel as a driver, there are going to be clear consequences. Some of those are controlled by what happens at home, but they also need to understand that there are consequences beyond that in the legal system, in the context right. of social hosting laws that could put mom and dad at risk as well. So framing right. that conversation is really important. But also, you know, discussing, I think, a plan of action if you find yourself right. that you have driven somewhere and you are there and you've been drinking, it's okay to change the plan. Yeah. It's okay to then call mom or dad to put, you know, but do not, absolutely do not under any circumstances get behind the wheel. And, you know, are there some ways that you can talk to kids and sort of balance that message of, you know, non-use versus harm reduction and, sure. you know, not encouraging them to, like, go to a party that they drove to and drink and that mom and dad's just going to pick them up, but that they know that if that is the case, that they can do that, it is safe, and we'll deal with other stuff later. You know, how do parents manage and sort of straddle that divide? Yeah, I, I'd say there's there's two things there to unpack. I mean, first of all, again, understanding the consequences of what happens. I, I would make sure that, that students and, and your kiddos know that you're going to be a lifeline. You're going to be that lifeboat to get them out of that safe, that safe or that unsafe situation. And that's the most important thing in that moment. But the right. next day, there are going to be consequences and follow-up conversations. And so you can frame it kind of in that context, I think, is is one thing that, that really helps as well. And then number two, again, I think it's important to understand what do you do if your friend is impaired or high or in an unsafe situation? How can you be an advocate for them in that environment is really important as well. So you can almost use bystander interventions to help train your young person on how to get out of those risky situations. Um, again, hopefully they're not in that position, but you can use that as a, hey, how do we get out of here? You know, I've, I've, again, I've talked with parents coast to coast and even developing little taglines or little little uh, strategies like, hey, if I text you um, three X's in a row, that's a sign that I'm in an unsafe situation. And mom, dad, I need you to call me and be really mad so that I can say, hey, I did something wrong. I got to go home. Right. I tell my daughter that yeah. all the time. I'm like, I'll be the bad guy. And she's told me before, like, mom, so-and-so wanted me to go here. I wanted me to do this. And I just said, like, my mom would be so pissed. And like, I, she's like, I kind of threw you under the bus. I was like, that's fine. That's, that's right. what I'm here for. Make me the bad guy. I don't care what your friends think of me. Uh, you, <laughs> I was like, I really, you know. You can handle it, right? You can handle right. a yeah, mad like, teenager. I don't, if your friends don't like me and think I'm lame, <laughs> that's fine. I probably am because I'm old now. I think also, you know, there's a myth that kind of goes around uh, that, you know, everyone is, is doing it. And Absolutely. that's all, you know, and every team, I mean, I I hear it from my teens all the time, but everyone's going, but everyone's doing this. What are some of the ways that we can kind of help teens combat that peer pressure and, you know, debunk that myth of everyone? Yeah, I mean, first by just doing that, right? Uh, having some, some hard data, I mean, you can get nerdy again and point to some statistical and scientific sources to show that, you know, we are making great gains in underage drinking. Underage drinking is decreasing. We've still got some work to do in some other substance abuse uh, areas. But, you know, the majority of young people are living healthy, safe, successful lives that are free of substances. They're not making risky choices behind the wheel. So I think it's, you know, again, it sounds cliche, which probably means it's true, that it's so important. <laughs> important to know uh, the friends of your, your kiddos, to just create every opportunity to build relationships with them, to understand and cre you know, create a safe space at your house where they can hang out so that you can understand the dynamic of what's happening. And then, you know, use those as anecdotes. Well, you know, you guys were at our house two weeks ago and we were having a bonfire and no one was drinking, right? So you really don't right. need substances to have a good time because that was a good time, right? Right. right. Great. So debunking those you know, systematically with data uh, and then also with those personal anecdotes really can go a long way as well. We'll be right back after this message. Saving lives means staying informed. Knowing the dangers of using fake prescription pills can help those you care about and keep our community safe. As a parent, educator, neighbor, or friend, we all play a role in building safe and healthy futures for ourselves and our loved ones. 
Do your part to take the first step today. Visit GetSmartAboutDrugs.com to access education, prevention, and treatment resources. Fake prescription pills laced with fentanyl are deadly. Be their protector. Be informed. Visit GetSmartAboutDrugs.com. I remind my kids constantly of the idea that, you know, the every, everyone, everything, all the time, that's not ever, it's never true. It's never, it's never everything everywhere all at once. No. It's, you know, and then that is, you know, as a teen, you don't want to miss out. You don't want to, you want to be a part of, you want to yeah, be cool. Yeah, yeah. You know, and the reminder that like, every, you, it's, you know, there's not some great thing that's happened that everyone else is getting to do that you're not. And this is not one of those things. Yeah. Um, and, you know, just such a great way to remind them, like, well, remember when we had this fun? That wasn't drinking. Right. You know, and kids forget that. Yeah. yeah. Or I've also seen parents, you know, do a little you know, story re- rewind is what it's called when you pull up your child's social media and be like, hey, remember when we did this? That were you impaired there? Nope. Okay, what about this? Right. Because, you know, FOMO, if you're missing out, it is a real thing. Here you can actually use social media to your advantage and do a little rewind to remind your young person of some moments where they were happy, having fun, and they were totally substance-free. I know as a parent, one of the things that terrifies me is sort of the lack of practice, I guess, that really is required to get your license. Yeah, you're, you, you nailed it uh, yet again. You know, when we think about um, careers or uh, professions, uh, in order to become a manicurist in most states, you need over 1,000 hours of practice. To become a licensed barber in many parts of the country, you need 5,000 hours. Uh, you know, a mortician or um, any other professional, you, you require dozens and dozens, thousands and thousands of hours. But in most states, in order to get that piece of plastic that says you're licensed to drive, you need 50 or less. Uh, and for those who are you know, over the age of 18, you need zero hours. In most states, at 18, uh, as a full-fledged uh, adult, you can walk into a DMV, an RMV, uh, a, a licensing branch, take a test, take a written test, take a driving test, and man, you are out the door. We forget that driving is an art and a science. And any art that you would have, if you're learning to play the violin, if you're playing soccer, it requires constant refining of a skill because there is a skill associated with this. That's where that science comes in, understanding how the vehicle is going to stop and the distance required to stop. And for most young people, when they're going through this season of becoming um, either a pre-licensed driver or they've got their, their learner's permit, they're driving during one literal season. So you know, I grew up in rural Ohio, uh, and so with a January birthday – um, I'd kind of missed some of the worst parts of winter. So it was a full year right. before I came back around to really understand what driving in winter conditions was like. Even worse for my friends who were, you know, June or July birthdays. They were practicing right. and only driving in the pitch perfect conditions of summer where it was light till 10 p.m. Right. And, and life was good. So this right. idea of practice isn't just about counting the number of hours. My, I will say I have a, my mom was excellent at this. My Good. mom made me, yeah, she, um, I, I was allowed to get my permit and mm-hmm. then I could only drive with her in the car. Yep. I had to log a certain amount of my, and she like a certain amount of miles and it wasn't hours. It was miles mm. because she was like, look, that's, I can keep track of that on the odometer. You know what I mean? Rather yeah. than like, yeah. So it, we, we would count down, and I had to get, I think it was like 2,000 miles or something like that. I had to get a lot of practice mm-hmm. and a lot of time with my mom in the car. And even then, it was like, okay, I could go somewhere, but I couldn't drive anybody yet. Right. And, of course, you know, at 16, I was like, this is so lame. My mom won't let me go, and I should be free. And, right, know, yeah, Now yeah, I'm like, yeah. thank you, because it's terrifying. I mean, I sat in the passenger seat of my kid driving through the empty parking lot and I was like okay break 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 no 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 other other foot other foot other foot you know (laughs) it's scary right well, and, let's, and they need practice. They do. And let's not forget that their point of reference in most times is maybe driving the riding lawnmower if you live in that area. Or their other <laughs> point of reference are video games where, right. you know, you're not feeling the pressures. You're not dealing with other drivers. And there's Mm-mm. also do-overs in video games. You know, you crash. Right. Yeah, you, you crash and do a roll. Yeah. Right. Oh, well, back on the road. You next know. next level, wait three seconds right. and you're you're back to level four. That's, that's not right. how, you know, real life works. And so I think the more they can get comfortable behind the wheel, understand, you know, how different things in the vehicle work. Mm -hmm. And don't forget, too, if you're switching the cars in which they're operating, you know, if they're maybe driving dad's pickup truck one day and then mom's sedan the next, those cars are going to operate differently. They've got different gadgets inside, different automated um, uh, safety devices. Those are all things to take into consideration as well, because oftentimes our teen drivers get what's left 
or they get whatever car is available. So making right. sure you build in some extra time to have them get reacquainted uh, with the vehicle itself is just as important too. Yeah, and I find myself, my daughter, you know, like I said, is in the car, so I find myself a lot of times explaining traffic rules to her. Like, yes. okay, see this center turn lane. Okay, do you see those little dots on one side of it? That means you can, you know, use it for this. You see two double yellows? Don't ever go on those, you yeah. know, things like that. And and we, and I'll quiz her sometimes. We'll be driving. I'm like, okay, can you, on a red light, can you make a right turn into, the, you know, what lane do you turn into? Things like that. And Bravo, it's really mom. helpful. And I remember, well, I remember my, that was what my mom did with me to like drill it in. How far away should you stop? When should you, you know, how long do you stop at a stop sign? Who has the right of way? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You yeah. Know? And, and we've talked so much about relationships and bonds like in, in these episodes. And, you know, some of my best memories of, you know, being a teenager with my dad yeah. was driving in the car with yeah. him. Like, you know, we had that time together. It was just the two of us. Like it was our thing that we we're doing together. We were trapped together. Perhaps we had to chat a little bit more. <laughs> and even even just yesterday, my mom has an electric car. I drove that here today. I've never driven an electric car. She was teaching me again. It was like it's yeah. so old weird. Days. It was yeah. like the good old days. But, but yeah. it's such an opportunity to have these hours together with your child and, and making memories in some ways, too, even while you're clutching, you know, the right. side right. of the car. And <laughs> your heart is yes. you know, racing. Empty parking lots are your best friend. <laughs> absolutely. Right. Yeah, that's so right. What you're really talking about is engagement. And engaging young people in the process is absolutely key, whether it's you know, doing those little quizzes or maybe even going a step farther when you look at what airline pilots do when they're in training, they literally do, they literally do a vocal um, output, if you will, of what they're doing, okay, lowering flaps 30 degrees, and then a little history about why you're doing that, okay, I'm slowing down to brake because I, I don't know which car, which way that car is going to go, I don't know what's going to happen here, but I think engagement comes in many forms, uh, it also comes in, you know, driving contracts, uh, SAD, the organization I used to lead, I was one of the first organizations to come up with what we called the contract for life, an agreement for understanding. Uh, that really goes back to a point we made earlier about making sure that there's shared expectations, but again, there's shared, uh, there's shared understanding of what the rules of the road will be. You know, uh, so oftentimes I've talked with parents and they say, well, you know, the law says this, and I call a timeout. I say the law may say that. But until that young person turns 18, you are legally and financially responsible for anything they do as a driver. So you can always toughen those rules. And even though the graduated driver's licensing laws in your state may say you can have one passenger, I think you want to restrict that. I think you want to make sure that there's no one else in the car except maybe mom or dad. Even siblings yeah. can be uh, a risk. And so you want to make sure that uh, engaging that young person includes some sort of contract. There are lots of templates. Your insurance agency has a template. SAD has a template. Lots of ideas of, of how you can form that process. But then sit down and have your young person form that agreement with you. Okay, what are what are our expectations? Okay, you need to be home by X X time. Uh, I will tell you, my grandmother always told me nothing good happens after midnight. The data supports that. My mom said that, that too, except it was 1030. <laughs> oh, I would have well, taken midnight. No, I think yeah. it might have been midnight. Stricter. Nothing, good, nothing <laughs> good ever happens after midnight. Yeah, hey, yeah. Uh, I, I can't be awake wrong. after 1030 anymore. You know, you hit 30 Maybe. and it's all downhill, right? Uh, <laughs> Uh, but again, coming up with uh, a rules of the road around nighttime driving restrictions because the data clearly shows us that the, the later a teen drives, the more risk they put themselves at. Understanding around passengers, understanding around, uh, again, distractions in the, in the wheel. You know, you agree not to eat or drink things. They're even non-alcoholic behind the wheel because anything that takes your eyes, your mind, or your hands off of the task of driving really does put you in a, a vulnerable spot, particularly for uh, a younger driver. So you want to make sure that, you, there are, that there's that agreement from the onset and then there are consequences of okay we agree that if you violate this you're going to lose the keys for a week or you'll lose your cell phone for x period of time those those shared understandings and making them part of the process automatically brings in the buy-in and makes them feel like this isn't just uh cracking the whip or laying down the law it's literally making sure we we are working together to keep everyone safe right one of the things I've really found to be helpful are apps like Life360 and things like that. You know, I have it on my phone. I can see if my kids are in a car. I can see how fast that car is going. I, it will yeah. record their weekly, you know, rides and tell me if they've been in a car. You know, how many fast accelerations, how many fast, you know, abrupt stops, things like that. And, you know, my kids aren't even driving yet, but I can see already what's going on and who, you know, who they're with. And those types of things I think are really really important and also it's important to not stare at it the entire time your kid is gone 
because that will drive yeah. you crazy. But to n- let them know that, hey, I can see this. So just so you know, I'm going to be looking at it mm-hmm. and there will be discussions. That, you know, it's a lot easier than when I was a kid. I mean, my mom had, you know, <laughs> like you'd get in the car and bye. And then that was it. Right. right. I- accountability comes in many forms, right? I mean, that's a mm-hmm. great way to leverage technology to hold your young person accountable for the decisions that they make. But I think it's also a great opportunity to say, hey, I noticed you were in a car and that car was going over the speed limit. Did you speak up and say anything? You'll probably get like right. a deer in the headlights look. Well, let's, <laughs> well talk, huh? let's talk about what you should have said because that, again, creates an environment for self-advocacy and the importance mm-hmm. of speaking up. And it creates another opportunity for you to be the bad guy as the parent and say, hey, you know what? When you're in that car and someone's driving too fast, which we know speed is a leading cause of teen death and injury on our roadways – when you're in that car and someone's going too fast, say, hey, you got to slow down. My mom can track me. I want She knows she knows what's happening, and I'm going to get in trouble if you don't. Uh, then there are always, you know, again, other other mechanisms you can, you know, invoke. You feel sick. You have to go to the bathroom. You feel like you're going to throw up. So it creates a space, again, to talk about how do you protect yourself when maybe you aren't the driver, but you're in a vehicle where I think we've all been there at some point. We know our driver is making less than safe decisions so important, especially if they're a teen driver, to come up again with a plan and some some avenues to get out of that vehicle. And that technology gives you a great out to talk about that self-advocacy and to do some reflection of maybe when the perfect choices weren't made, what would you do the next time to make sure that you were safe? Rick, that's super helpful. Are there other uh, technology or technologies that you're aware of that parents can kind of have in their toolbox for these types of things? Yeah, you know, one of the best ones is, again, if you check with your insurance agent, most insurance companies are using some sort of technology, in-vehicle technology to gauge exactly that same, uh, to use that same technology and then to apply it to insurance rates. So this allows you to now make the insurance agent the bad guy and say, hey, you know what, this device is going inside your car and if you go faster, hey, guess what, you're going to have to pay the insurance premiums because it's going to raise your rates. So any sort of that technology, I would check with your local insurance agent to see what platforms that might be on. Good news, too, on the cost-saving side, oftentimes they award teen drivers a discount if they do Mm -hmm. install that technology and they allow it to be – if they do exhibit those behaviors of being a safe motorist, oftentimes they get a little discount. Do a simple search in the app store. Um, Mm -hmm. Lots of other companies that offer some advanced driver's ed instruction as part of that because we know – Driver's Ed, even though many people still think it's the 1980 videos of prom night and whatnot, it's it's right. really important. Again, that's an opportunity to have a trained professional give some written instruction and some behind the wheel experience to your to your young person. Uh, it gets you out of the hot seat a little bit because it allows you to again have that professional to be the right. one uh, breaking the ice and getting those maneuvers. Also, partners like the Governor's Highway Safety Association, the National Safety Council, and the National Road Safety Foundation have incredible resources on this and so much more where you can access their um, their apps and their resources uh, as well as SAD. They've got the, their Passport to Safe Driving, which looks at the top 10 leading causes of death and injury related to skills that young people don't have and provides mm-hmm. you an opportunity to scan a QR code to listen to podcasts just like this. Uh, on each of those topics, you know, how do I teach left-hand turns? Because as much as we want to be good coaches to our young people, there's no guidebook on how to teach your kid how to drive. So some great resources out there that, again, leverage technology to, to develop those skills that are so important to the long-term safety of a young person on the roads. I am definitely putting some of those in my toolbox. <laughs> and yeah. as always, all of those resources, thanks, Rick, will be in the show notes below. Yeah, so uh, Rick, I'm wondering if you could speak to a little bit more. Like one of the things we talk to parent, families, parents, and young people we work with a lot is how the research shows that even if you're using things like cannabis and you're not under the influence currently, mm-hmm. that you're still at a higher, much higher risk of getting into car accidents. And so the impact of that cannabis is still lingering in your brain much after the initial kind of intoxication. Yeah, the, the first thing I would say is that, you know, I'm always mindful of what one advocate told me that when we call these accidents, we forget the element of choice, right? When you talk about an accident, that's something that was not was not uh, preventable and was just a, a fluke of the world. Uh, I mean, these are crashes that have consequences because of choices that were made. And the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration has a campaign that says, if you feel different, you drive different. And I think that's the important thing to remember is that impairment isn't you know, a .08 or it isn't a measure of THC in our system. Right. It can be cold medicine. 
It can be, you know. Lack of sleep. Yeah. It's an inability to safely make sound decisions and respond in real time to stimulus that are happening around us. So, you know, when you go to the pharmacist and you get that prescription and it says, hey, don't operate heavy machinery, or we're not talking about forklifts. We're talking about motor, <laughs> right, yeah. we're talking about motor kind vehicles. Of cars. Right. Correct. Yeah. When we talk about, you know, cannabis, uh, I did a focus group in the suburbs of Chicago and I had a dad come up to me and say, hey, Rick, this is great. Thanks for talking to my kids about, you know, cannabis. But, you know, I, I went to Woodstock. I, I think I was fine. Uh, I think it's important to remind parents that the cannabis of today, just like most of the other produce that's happening in our world, has been genetically modified. And the THC levels, the active ingredient in cannabis that is that is the impairing substance, in some cases is 80 times what it was of the cannabis in the 1980s and beyond. So it's right. important to understand that when you start to uh, build up the risky decisions that young people make, alcohol with cannabis with speed you can see how this doesn't become an a plus b equals c it becomes an a to the fourth times b to the sixth which can result in lots of horrendous and uh, catastrophic results yeah uh i i think that's it's so important to remind um you know kids and young people about that that you are now you're not only making a decision and a choice for yourself you're making it for the people in your car you're making it for the people in the car next to you it's so scary so to go back to what we were talking about before too just a reminder to folks that you know if if your kids are drinking and you know they, they had their car that night you know that you want to encourage them to know that they can call you that you'll be there to pick them up no judgment no mm -hmm. argument in the evening it's not going to go anywhere anyway if they've been drinking <laughs> right. it's going to be a very you know they might not even remember any of that conversation but you're just going to be there to support them to care for them right and and you'll deal with kind of the next steps you know the next day um but be there for them help them out of that that difficult situation so that they know how to handle it in the future yeah it's all about making the next best choice you can to protect your safety and the safety of people in your squad and the people of even the strangers that are sharing the roadway with Absolutely. Well, Rick, thank you so much for joining us today. Really, really appreciate it. Um, as, like I said, as a mom to someone who is starting this process, I'm, I'm collecting all the tools that I can get. Absolutely. Um, but I really appreciate you sharing this with us because uh, it can be a scary time for parents and for kids. Um, but thank you so much for joining us for Awkward Conversations today. Really appreciate it and a lot of great information. Thanks for having me, guys. And good luck, Mom. You can get through it. <laughs> thank you. Thank you so much for joining us for another episode of Awkward Conversations. Uh, I am so glad to be joined by Amy McCarthy. And make sure you join us again for more Awkward Conversations next week, where we will be covering more things uh, on parenting, bringing up your kids, and making sure that they have all the tools they need to be successful, smart decision makers. We are out of time, everyone, but please join us next week for another Awkward Conversation. Today on Awkward Conversations, we're confronting the often overlooked topics of mental health and drug prevention in our youth. I see kids being stressed from about everything from their grades to their friendship issues to what they're gonna wear on Saturday or who they're hanging out with, what to do. And they're dealing with things that a lot of us didn't deal with like social media. I think it's really important for us as adults, for parents, as therapists, to really work with kids to help them to identify what these, um, what their triggers are, what the stresses they're experiencing are, and really come up with plans for how do, how do we cope with stress, right? And make sure to check out GetSmartAboutDrugs.com. Parents, caregivers, you can find so many resources of great information there about how to talk to your kids and make these conversations a little less awkward. A huge thank you to the Elks DAP, which is the largest all volunteer nationwide drug awareness program. And also a huge thanks to the DEA for their outreach program and for making this possible. The views, information, or opinions expressed during the Awkward Conversation series are solely those of the individuals, speakers, commentators, experts, and or hosts involved, and do not necessarily reflect nor represent those of the production, associates, or broadcaster, or any of its employees. Production is not responsible and does not verify for accuracy any of the information contained in the series available for viewing. The primary purpose of this series is to educate and inform. This series does not constitute medical or other professional advice or services. This series is available for private, non-commercial, commercial use only. The production, broadcaster, or its channel cannot be held accountable for all or any views expressed during this program.